Good morning. My name is Mark Baldessari, and welcome to the Bechtel Conference Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. We're very happy today to be co-hosting this uh, session on um, higher education priorities for the next governor with the Cal College Futures Foundation. And the College Futures Foundation uh, not only co-hosted this event with us, but uh, supported the uh, survey, which we're going to be talking about, the 2018 uh, PPIC statewide survey on Californians and higher education. Those of you who are here with us, you have a, a copy of the survey at your, um, uh, on your seat, at your seat. And those of you who are online, you could look it up on our website. And it's a, a real a pleasure and a, an honor and um, uh, really appreciate the fact that, that Monica Lozano is here today, the president of the College Futures Foundation, uh, who has been for many years um, a thought partner for me in the area of higher education as, as she has uh, assumed various leadership positions, including um, on the UC Regents. So it's great to have Monica involved in this uh, discussion today. And it's great to have all of you both who are um, uh, online with us on our website uh, and those of you who are here today. And um, uh, I appreciate the fact that you came out and under these uh, conditions that we're, we're facing here in the Bay Area and of course all that's going on in the state. Uh, we recognize um, at this time and I just want to uh, yeah, certainly acknowledge we, we really feel for the people of the, who are experiencing the fires, uh, both the Camp Fire and the Wolsey Fire in Northern and Southern California. And, uh, and for, for, for all, all of us at PPIC, you know, our hearts go out to the people who are, uh, who are experiencing those, um, uh, th those terrible conditions that they have, um, uh, th that they're facing. And, and uh, we understand that, uh, that our leaders appropriately Today, that is a priority, is to take care of, of those communities and, and the situation that, that is being faced. But we also recognize that um, there is uh, a future for California. And we, we are here today to talk about uh, an important part of that future, higher education. I, uh, before I um, uh, ask Monica to make some comments, I, I do want to acknowledge that, that that's sitting with us today is the uh, Lieutenant Governor-elect, Eleni Kunalakis, who was elected. Um, and uh, we congratulate you, and we're looking forward to working with you. Um, and I want to acknowledge the fact that um, um, Eleni Kunalakis was the first woman who was elected Lieutenant Governor. We had a Lieutenant Governor for a very short period of time, a few months. Um, who act, was in an acting capacity, Eleni is the first woman who was elected governor. And uh, we're very proud and, and of that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And just one other word about Eleni um, th th that I want to mention. Our, our former lieutenant governor uh, came in for, has come in for several briefings on higher education. <laughs> and. Um, our, our lieutenant governor-elect um, had two briefings uh, at PPIC, one specifically on higher education. And we, we look for you. So you're, you're following in some uh, footsteps that uh, we're talking about today, the, the, the new governor, and, and look forward to working with you. So Monica, you and I uh, talked last week uh, about the new survey. Um, and you. Uh, uh, we didn't have a chance to, to discuss it in detail, but, but there were things that uh, I, I'm sure in this week as you process it, processed it, some, some major takeaways for you. And uh, I was looking across the table from you at various times and some things that seemed to be surprises when, when we were discussing them. So I, I wonder if you could share with us your, your major takeaways and, and, and some of the surprises that you had in the survey. Thanks, Mark. And, um, Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I know how difficult it is to navigate, um, so I really do appreciate your interest in higher education and in learning um, about the survey and, and some of the findings of the survey. And it was a great uh, pleasure to work with PPIC and with you, Mark. Um, we've been partners on many projects over many, many years, and so having the opportunity for College Futures to, co to sponsor um, this particular survey was, was really important to us. 
Um, so a couple of things, and I, I understand that we're going to be talking together for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So um, recognizing that you probably haven't had a chance to read all 92 pages of the survey, um, hopefully we'll hit some highlights and then get a chance to take questions and, and converse about it. So a couple of things. Um, to me, I, I sort of bucket them. Um, one has to do with the importance of a college degree. And overwhelmingly, Californians said a four-year degree is essential to the economic vitality of the state. And as much as we have um, considered Jerry Brown a real progressive on lots of issues, there is a sense that he did not do enough on higher education. And the California public is interested in a change in policy towards higher education. And in fact, almost three quarters, more than 75%, excuse me, more than 75% say that um, Gavin Newsom, the new governor, should make higher education a top priority. So that's one set of findings, the importance and the value of a four-year degree, a readiness for change, and almost a challenge to the new governor that he make this a top priority. The second set of issues that emerged, at least for me, have to do with um, the concern that Californians have about the student, the factors that contribute to student success. Um, very concerned, less about issues of access and enrollment, which used to be primary. You know, they just felt that there was the access issue mattered. Now it's really about the factors that contribute to student success and how do you support students. So the first thing they say is we need to deal with college affordability. There's issues around student debt. There's issues around financial aid um, and, and student supports inside the, the institution. So it's, it's, to me, it was fascinating how clearly the public is putting students at the center of this equation. And then lastly, I would say that the California public um, realizes that the funding mechanisms that support our, in particular, the four-year institutions, the UC and the CSU, are inadequate. And they're looking for ways to better finance higher education. And in fact, they're willing to tax themselves. And they're willing to issue debt and, and support bonds for construction. So if you kind of put it in that continuum, the status quo isn't acceptable. Challenging the next governor to actually do something about it and do it for students, and then recognizing that we need to redesign the financing of California's um, public higher education um, was a revelation. You know, willing to actually tax ourselves and then support um, uh, the issuance of debt and, and a bond to better support those institutions. So those were my three big takeaways, and they're all big, and we can unpack them. Um, but that was how I, I interpreted the survey. Any surprises for you? Any surprises? On the, um, on the financing side, well, there's a lot of things that are unique, and, and we can talk about them. And I've, I've got it. But one of the things that I really um, appreciated was the willingness to tie Yes, they feel like they need to um, better um, design the financing system so that they can depend, the, the four years in particular, have um, a funding stream that is dependable, but they want to tie it to student outcomes. There's an accountability piece that is important. So it's not just more money to give you more money, but they actually want to see um, the systems do things better and tie it to, to student outcomes, which I thought was interesting. Fantastic. And yes, please, if you have any questions, consider this like a college classroom. <laughs> um, and just you know, raise your hand, ask a question. If nobody raises their hand and asks a question, I, I was a professor for 20 years, so I'll, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> Um, and there's you know, people in the audience that know yeah, a lot more about right. this than Mark and I do. And so. going back to my uh, college professor days, I'll, I'll start with the people in the back row, probably, <laughs> um, who are reading other things and things like that. Uh, Monica, do you have any questions you'd like to ask me as the pollster? Well, I'm curious, Mark, about um, 
making this the, the top priority. So the political aspect of this, because I think the issues that have to do with the delivery of education, um, high regard for UC, CSU, the community colleges. But were you surprised about the reference to Jerry Brown vis-a-vis -vis his commitment to higher education and then the, the level of support to make this a priority in the new administration? You know, when we asked the question, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so the fact that it came back at 74% uh, was a surprise to me, because that's, 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 a, that's a high number. Um, and it's, uh, there were other findings in the survey that, uh, for me, uh, meant that uh, the, the public doesn't make the big distinction between K-12 or K-14 and higher education that, uh, that we see in our budget process and that we see in our, our policy making process. There were a lot of numbers in the survey that were consistent with the way uh, people feel about um, K to 12 today, that there's, that there's not enough funding, that it's, in, that it's important for the future. They want, the, uh, they want to see the whole system working. Uh, they don't want just to focus on one, one element uh, and especially, um, you know, and, and, and not paying attention to another um, as much as it should. So that number was surprising. And so for me, it's, it's also, it's all about the cross tabs, you know, which, which I carry around with me and look at them and study them and, um, uh, uh, and try to understand areas where there's consensus. Uh, because so many things that we talk about today in California we break down by party, or we break down by region, or by age group, or by race and ethnicity. When it comes to higher education being a priority, um, and when it comes to education being important for California's future, we see, con we see consensus. Um, and you know, from, from a political standpoint and a policy standpoint, consensus is always a good starting point. You know? uh, people don't have all the answers. But, there, but there's some basic agreement that this is an area that we should be, uh, that we should be paying attention to. And uh, there, there were two questions which uh, came up with very similar results, again, looking for consist consistency. And that is the people who say that they'd like to see a new direction, mm -hmm. and the people who feel that we're not going in the right direction right now. And uh, so that, uh, given the fact that the, the, the systems themselves get very high rating. It comes back to the point you made about affordability and affordability for students. Um, and that's really what's driving all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the public's views about, uh, uh, about affordability right now and wanting improvement, wanting a new direction, is thinking about how do we make this affordable for students? You, um, there was a question that was asked about um, is affordability uh, tied more to tuition and fees? And should we be thinking about tuition and fees, or is it living expenses and housing costs? And there was some variance regionalized between um, those who thought we really needed to deal with a tuition policy versus the, those who were saying um, it's really about the total, co what we call the total cost of attendance, which takes into account mm. housing and, and cost of living by region. Um, what were your observations? Well, we were, uh, we were glad that we asked that question because, uh, you know, th that when I go and talk to um, higher education leaders very often, like last year, um, last November, when uh, we, uh, we presented the results to the UC Board of Regents, and um, we raised the public's uh, perspective on affordability, you know, often the comments are, and I can talk to you now because you're an ex-regent uh, about these things, <laughs> um, are like, well, but we're given all these scholarships and things, and people don't have to, you know, so many people don't have to pay tuition and fees who are going to Cal State. We have Le Leroy Morishita here, terrific president of, of Cal State uh, East Bay as well. So it's not just the UC. But the, the fact of the matter is that there's, that there's more to affordability than, than tuition and fees, and so much 
of the discussion has been wrapped up around, uh, oh, the, you know, is there going to be a 10% increase, and, what, and how many students are going to take care of, uh, be able to take care of their tuition and fees, when the reality is that housing is very expensive in this state, um, and many people are facing long commutes, and so there are living expenses and housing expenses, particularly uh, the, the respondents from the, the coastal regions of California understand that, although uh, I'm certain that, that students in all regions of the state are facing uh, not just the tuition and fees and housing affordability. So as a former region and as now a, a foundation president, um, can you offer us some guidance as to how we deal with the, uh, th this broader issue of affordability that surfaced in this poll? Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not the expert in it, but um, certainly there's a lot of people who are looking at the issue of affordability. And right now, the California Student Aid Commission is reviewing the formula that they use for financial aid, um, primarily because of the reasons that you just talked about, um, Mark, which is that it doesn't take into account regional differences. It doesn't take into account total cost of attendance, which has to do with housing. We know that there's food insecurity for lots of students. The individual segments are doing things around that, um, food pantries, I mean, the sorts of things that you wouldn't expect in California and that shouldn't be associated with the um, systems of higher education in the state of California. So awareness of the problem, and frankly, um, as a regent, I, as a former regent, um, it was the students who brought this to our attention. Um, you know, four or five years ago, they were the ones who stood up and said, it's not right that I live in a car. It's not right that I have to go without a meal because I'm making a decision between whether or not I can afford my books or I'm going to feed myself today. So these issues have now surfaced. Um, the entities that are responsible for them are trying to figure out what is the right, um, the right response. It's a very big number when you think about um, what that calculation could be if you took in total cost of attendance. So how do you actually reframe that? We also know that a number of the community colleges, um, some research that we just did, that um, there are certain community colleges in the state of California that don't direct their students towards um, federal financial aid, although they're eligible for it. So just creating practices at the campus level that direct students to what are you actually eligible for and giving them the kinds of guidance um, that, that, that they need, especially if you're first generation, um, if you're from a, a low income or underrepresented student group, just navigating that, it should not be so complicated. Um, right now for um, four years uh, institutions, for our lowest income students, it takes 55% of total family income to cover the net cost of attending, 55% of total family income. And for community colleges, which are, and there's some data in our survey that says everybody wants free community colleges for the first two years, but for our lowest income community college students, it takes 45% of their total income to cover the net cost of attendance. So it's a real problem, and um, you know, folks are, are trying to figure out what to do about it. And what was interesting, back to our survey, 61% of all Californians think that there is not enough government support in our financial aid system. So 61%, I thought that was a pretty sophisticated number, that they recognize that the financial aid system is not adequate um, to support students today. And that number was, was almost identical to the number of Californians who said that there's not enough funding in, um, for pu public higher education today from the state government. So um, I think that the two are, are, are connected. This is, again, why I think that people are, when, when, they, when they're thinking about where the funding is needed and where it should go, um, they're not thinking about the systems they're thinking about the students um, and what the students' needs are. Um, so what do you think about this idea of free community college? Should that be a, a high priority for the next governor? I'm, um, I, am, I personally, this is my, it's not college futures, but I personally um, think that we need tuition policies that are predictable, moderate, and that 
allow families to plan. Um, community college has a very unique role. So even if it's tuition free, there are still lots of expenses associated with community colleges. Um, I'm not an expert in the, in the area of, of the promise, the community college promises. But personally, um, I think it's fair for students to know, to have transparency in, in the model and to let families plan over as a cohort. So if you come in as a freshman, you should know what the tuition increase is going to be. It should be tied to cost of living. It should be very moderate. But you should be able to plan. When you come in and four or five or six years later, you know. And so you're able to, um, to moderate based on that. And right now, as everybody knows, um, and I'm not answering the community college question. I'll let somebody else answer. But um, <laughs> the tuition policy, tuition at um, the four-year institutions, um, not tuition, but the way in which you finance the four-year institutions, there are two revenue streams, general fund and tuition. And every time we hit an economic downturn, and even though this governor is going to um, uh, receive probably the flushest reserve of any governor, um, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that we're going to hit an economic downturn. And that will shrink the general fund. And because higher education is in the discretionary category, it ends up getting slashed. Um, and so institutions turn to students and tuition. And, and that model, the unpredictability of that model, the volatility of that model, um, needs to be addressed. And so that's why I was fascinated by these numbers around um, minimum levels of state funding, of new mechanisms of state funding, of tying them to accountability measures. Um, and to your point about crosstabs, Mark, one thing that was interesting, um, the minimum level of state funding 63% supported it across party lines. Mm -hmm. um, Republicans were less interested on the, the tax question bonds, and the bonds. Yeah. But when you, when you averaged it out among likely voters, um, close to two thirds majority ready to, ready to go. Tell me what you think about that. I think you know how to read cross tabs really well. <laughs> I'm impressed, you taught me. I, I how many that, surveys so, did we do with yeah. PPIC over the years? <laughs> so the, the question on uh, minimum uh, spending, um, as, as I think probably all of you know, we, we have uh, through Prop 98, which has been around for 30 years. You know, it was passed um, 30 years ago. The um, uh, K, to, K to 12 is, um, is protected um, in the budget actually K to 14 through community college. So the question um, in our survey was, do you extend that to include higher education, which is basically you know, the, the two years that are, that are, that are left out, um, uh, or, or Cal State and UC, I should say, the, the four-year colleges that are left out. And a majority said yes. And so there is there's strong support for creating that certainty. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people ask me, why is Prop 13 so, still so popular today? It has so many problems and things like that. It's the certainty. People like certainty when it comes to, to, to spending and uh, to taxes. Whether or not uh, uh, something like a Prop 98 extension to higher education uh, has to, sees the light of day, there would be a lot of people who would oppose it politically. It gives policymakers at least a sense that this is a part of the, the budget that they don't want people messing with during um, the next downturn, like, like uh, we saw um, in um, the last downturn, and people turning to tuition and fees, or bringing more students from out of state, or denying more students admission the next time this happens. And hopefully that's a good uh, message to take to the, to the next governor. I'd love to ask you, because I thought this survey, which PPIC is responsible for the questions and really appreciate the fact that um, you were so thoughtful in putting these questions together. But you asked about split role. Yeah. And that's a big deal. So that's Prop 13 um, and the idea that there may actually be some movement to um, tax 
commercial property. Um, right now, it's both commercial and um, residential property. But there's some trending that you've identified on split rule. Yeah. So um, Prop, Prop 13 uh, currently treats uh, residential and commercial property at, um, uh, the same way, 1% 1, 1 of the sale price and then 2% increase per year. There's been an effort for many years, um, and, it, and there's now been enough signatures for, for this to be on the ballot in 2020 to change Prop 13 so that the commercial property taxes, the commercial properties would be taxed according to market value. The residential properties stay the same. Um, and we had asked a question about this uh, in terms of how the current ballot initiative is worded. Um, that would be that would give us an, we we asked a question in our K to 12 survey earlier in the year about the uh, this effort to, um, to to change Prop 13, which would provide more funding for K to 12 and local governments. That's the way it's currently worded. So we we asked the same question, but we just uh, put higher education in there instead of K to 12. The reason that we did this. Uh, Monica was so that we would have again a point of reference between how do people feel about new funding for K to 12 through this mechanism as opposed to higher education. The results were almost identical, which for us gives you yet another indication, like with the, the, the spending guarantee, that uh, and the, the percentage of people who say that there's not enough funding, which was almost identical to the to the K to 12, that that there is a parallel and, and similar interest in finding new uh, revenue sources. Now, the, the initiative that, as it's currently written, which, um, it, which the legislature now has some time to discuss, and the governor and legislature will be discussing it before it goes on the ballot um, um, in uh, November 2020. So, you know, there's an opportunity to look more broadly, I would think, at what the new revenues would take. And, and it's a very big, um, uh, several billions of dollars in additional revenues would come, not right away, but over time, through, uh, through the split roll. So it's a meaningful amount of new money. Uh, and the question is, uh, where would people like to see that money spent? And so one of the areas where people say that they'd like to see that money spent is not only K-12 and local government, but also higher education. So hopefully that gets in, involved in the early discussions um, about you know, whether there might be a compromise before it goes to the ballot. So I wanted to um, also talk about um, how students feel about their experience in higher education. But um, to just pick up on this point that you, that you made, um, if more money is appropriated to higher education, um, Californians want to see that money to go for student supports, which I thought was really interesting. It's not that they want you to use the money to increase enrollment and add more students. They want to make sure that students that are in are getting the kind of support. And then they say, who's ultimately responsible for student success? They put it on squarely on the shoulders of the institution. And that is a really important shift. Um, Mark, as you know, over too many decades, um, if students didn't complete, it was considered a failure of this individual student. Now Californians recognize that the institution has a responsibility to make sure that what students need, they get, and that success is an indicator of the institution not of the student. And it's, it's buried in this survey, but it comes out loud and clear. And one of the things, if, if you don't mind, I wanted to turn to um, some of the other questions that, that we asked about um, variance based on income and racial and ethnic um, uh, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. and the sense of opportunity in higher education for those students. Um, and there's a real distinction around um, whether or not students that are low income and of diverse backgrounds feel that they would have the same opportunity to succeed inside the institutions. Yeah. 
Um, a lot of uh, Californians feel that, um, that students from diverse backgrounds and lower incomes have less opportunity. And I think this is one of the reasons why um, Californians are uh, placing a, a premium on, on making sure that there is support for students um, who are in uh, colleges, uh, both support from the institutions in terms of, of helping them succeed, but also uh, financial support because there's a sense that, that things aren't all equal. And, um, and we've seen this in our other polling too. Californians understand that there are economic inequalities in the state, that there are, that there are equity gaps. Um, those efforts had, have been addressed and we found in our polling for K-12. They've been very popular when it comes to the local control funding formula and making sure that English learners and lower income, uh, students from lower income areas in K-12 have more resources. Uh, we, we've seen consistently, um, you know, since before and as, as that, uh, before we had that, that policy uh, to today, and Californians are saying the same applies to the, to the, the higher education system today. Do we have any questions or comments from, from our colleagues here in the audience? So um, NYU recently announced that they will allow students to enroll in medical school for free. Um, and it's a, obviously a private institution. And they did this through an endowment that they've been working on for a good 10, 15 years. And they don't have the full amount of money that they expected to raise yet, but they think they're ready to go. Um, do you envision something like that happening in California to kind of combat the shortage of primary care providers in underserved areas? That's a great question. And um, I'm not sure I know enough. There is a program at the UC, and I'm trying to remember what it's called. Nina, you might remember, Prime. It started at UC Irvine, and it's now extended to all campuses. And they identify um, students from diverse backgrounds and then provide them full scholarship as they make their way through medical school with the caveat that they're going to go back into communities of highest need and practice there. And I do think that especially in the professional schools, given how high professional fees are, um, there are lots of areas um, where you're actually moving towards a model like that where it's almost a loan forgiveness or a, a, a guarantee program if, in fact, you um, commit to public service. So it's a possibility. I think it's a really interesting idea for um, universities to consider. And I know there's folks here that are associated with universities or have been associated with universities. I don't know if you have any, yeah. any thoughts on something like this. There was another question over here. Yes. So I have. Uh, since we're at, since we're being webcast, we need. To oh, okay. okay. Uh, so I was also struck by the responses to who's responsible for student success and the uh, uh, responses about resources. And I wondered whether um, PPIC will be conducting any follow up So the the way the question in the survey is worded. Um, it asks about um, assist. Yeah. And so there are lots of ways mm -hmm. to assist students, one of which is financial assistance and uh, funding f uh, streams for higher ed. But uh, I wondered whether you're planning to do any follow-up to kind of unpack what people had in their minds when they saw the word assist. Yeah, uh, we, we do, yeah. It's the first time we asked the question. We didn't really know what to expect. Um, and that question came from a national survey. So we wanted to keep the wording uh, the same. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to explore with, with that. Um, but Monica, in terms of real time practice on the ground now, what, what are we doing to assist um, students? And what are we doing that we could, could do more of? Well, um, it's actually an area that we're beginning to explore more at the foundation. And um, campus level supports that um, we're now thinking about what's called holistic student support. 
So it's not just about advising and counseling, it's what are all of the other supports that students need. Part of the challenge, of course, in California are the data systems. Um, individual student data systems are not um, designed with the student in mind, number one, to be able to actually deliver information to students. Um, you know, a lot of campuses still use the very traditional, you know, office hours with your counselor every, you know, quarter, um, as opposed to using technology. So we're investing in new technologies that will push information and make it much more interactive and trying to understand how to use, um, you know, more student-centered um, advising capabilities. And then at the campus level, helping campuses set up um, data systems so that they're tracking, I don't want to say tracking students in the old sort of, you know, metaphor, but they understand, you know, um, are you not showing up to class? Are you so many credits um, short of completion? If you do this, you might be able to make up and accommodate. So using data and technology to really do that, but that is only one component of this, which is around advising and counseling. This holistic student support also um, looks at behavioral issues and, and social issues and mental issues. And so how do you understand and, and recognize that when that student shows up on the campus, you're responsible for them. And understanding them and being able to deliver education in a way that responds to individual student needs is, is something that you know, we're hoping, and it's hard to do because you're operating at scale and you've got 15,000 students and you know, you're, it's hard to do, but um, we're trying to identify some practices that are scalable and can be um, adopted at the systems level. Mark, there were a couple of other things, if you don't mind, um, that I thought were really interesting because this one question, um, one had to do with prioritizing admissions based on um, regional um, locality. Yeah. So prioritizing students that, and it's interesting because community colleges in particular, you know, this idea that you are of a community and yet you have like these, um, you know, the, the um, best in class community colleges that are highly impacted and people want to go there. And so the distribution of students across the community colleges um, is, is quite challenged, and the same with the CSUs. CSUs, they were set up to be in local communities and to serve the local needs of those communities. Um, and Californians would like to see us go back to that, and I, I thought it was, it was really interesting. It was a, a very, uh, what we would call overwhelming uh, majority, too. I think it was 77% said that, um, that the location ought to be um, uh, a factor in where uh, students are admitted, where, where they live and where the school is. And that seems to me to also come down to the affordability issue too. Right. We know that um, <coughs> students prefer to attend a school that's within a 50 mile radius, primarily um, because of all of those other issues that we just talked about. Many of them are working, they might be supporting family, they wanna stay close to home for one reason or another, they're living at home. And even those students that are living at home, the majority, people don't recognize this, the majority of those students are actually contributing to family household income. So it's not the old paradigm of, you know, I'm living with mom and dad and, you know, I show up for a meal. Um, these are hard-working students. Um, the other thing is, you know, the research says that students shouldn't work more than 15 hours a week. Um, and we've got some students that are working up to, you know, 25, 40, even more hours, and it delays time to degree. It puts additional burden on the segments themselves because you're not getting the throughput. And so, you know, the brilliance of this survey in so many ways, Mark, is that it, it really... Um, it creates a, a, a picture of the entire experience um, in a way that, that I thought was, was really smart. Can I, I wanted to shift gears if you don't mind. Sure. Um, there were fantastic numbers around um, the value of a degree. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about this a lot at College Futures because College Futures believes that it's not just access, but it's completion. 
there's lots of other um, reasons why we should invest in students that don't aspire to a four-year degree. But we know that the earning potential, the quality of life, the contribution back to community, I mean, there's just so many reasons why a four-year degree matters. And so overwhelming acknowledgment. But then when you ask the question, that or um, are there other ways to make a living? I can't remember how the question was worded. So it was uh, worded, and this was a national question which we've been asking for several years, and now we've added this question about the value of the four-year college degree. But the question was, um, is college necessary, or are there many other ways to succeed financially in today's work world? So, uh, and, and people say? were split they on were split. that. Yeah. However, 67% of Latinos right. said college, college is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for whites, it was less than 40%. So it's a big difference. Uh, and, and the difference is also between lower income and upper income Californians. Upper income Californians, more likely to say, oh, there are other ways to make money. Well, this point about um, the aspirational nature of Latinos and the willingness to invest in education, to support public financing, to see it as the, um, the gateway to a better life. Um, so the numbers around Latino support for a four-year degree, um, and especially given the demographics of California. I mean, this is the future population, our future workforce, um, and the fact that they've adopted this sense of yes to college. Um, so let me ask you a question, because our, if our, our center director is he's actually, uh, Hans Johnson is actually at a Cal State um, uh, activity today, helping advise on something. Uh, but he just like, he flips out every time he hears these findings about that college, <laughs> that so many people think that college isn't necessary. Um, and I'm like, well, calm down, you know, and <laughs> let's think about this, you know, rational response to it, something that we can say, you know. And so how do you, what do you say to people when, uh, when they say, oh, college is necessary? A lot of people think it's not necessary anymore. I say what I, what I just said, that um, there are distinct avenues towards um, you know, pathway to prosperity. Um, I think people continue to aspire to um, be able to provide for themselves, for their families, to contribute, et cetera. Um, given the changing nature of work, um, the reskilling, um, the opportunities that come with credentials, um, that's, that does exist and we should acknowledge it. Um, but there is no doubt in my mind that a college degree, especially given the nature of our economy moving forward mm -hmm. and the, the knowledge economy where we all want to participate, um, that, well, not that we all, but where I think the majority would like to participate, um, it's necessary to have a, a, a four-year degree. Um, and then the benefits that come with that, Mark. It's not just about your own personal income, that you'll make a million more dollars over your lifetime, but there is something that comes with that that creates a greater sense of permanence and place and contribution to community um, and contribution to your family and more civically engaged. So there are... Um, social aspects associated with having a four-year degree that are as important as the economic aspects? There are certain survey questions which we ask because it gives us a, a national comparison or because we've been asking them for a long period of time and we want to see if they have remained uh, stable or they're changing in one direction or another. This particular question on college is necessary, which we started asking back in 2007, because between 2007 and 2011, we were doing a, a higher education survey every year. And then we restarted it in 2016. Um, and between 2007 and 11, more people were saying it's necessary. And then it went to around 50-50 in 2016. And it's remained uh, stable at that in the last three surveys. So I have found the question to be useful for tracking purposes, but limited in terms of, 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 of what it tells us because of 
of actually how it's framed. And the way it's framed, if you're a respondent listening to it, is thinking, yeah, there, are, you know, you could win the lottery. There are a lot of things that could happen, right? Um, you could, you know, start the next Google, you know, something that that um, that 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 is not a sure thing. But there are many ways. There are other many ways that people can find their way to financial success. Um, so that is why we felt like it was important to ask specifically about the four-year college degree, and we'll be asking that one, um, you know, and seeing how that trend's going forward. You know, I, um, I'm going to work on my answer because I think we, we, I need to sharpen it. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think about um, listening to Chancellor Tim White from the CSU, listening to President Napolitano from the UC. Um, both of them have been so... Um, persuasive in the way in which they talk about both the economic, social, and moral components of this. Um, that at a time when California is becoming so much more diverse, and the students that are coming out of high school and going into college look like the students that we know, um, this is not the time to close the doors on those students. And so um, offering opportunity um, to the future workforce, the future Californians, is an obligation that we should all share. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'd like to, um, to uh, ask you a, a kind of a broader question that has to do with the priorities of the next uh, governor. And um, I, I heard him during the campaign talk about um, what he calls uh, cradle to career education. And uh, we've gotten to know um, uh, Gavin Newsom, when, as, as I mentioned, when he was running for lieutenant governor, he came and, and had a briefing from our staff and several times uh, in, in his, uh, during his time as lieutenant governor and then uh, as a candidate. We talked, and he's a person who's got, um, you know, uh, very strong uh, feelings about the importance of education. He's also somebody who's very bold and ambitious um, in terms of how he thinks about public policy issues. And, uh, and already I see with some of the people that will be in his inner circle, there'll be a focus on, on uh, I, I believe, on, cra on cradle to career. And so how do uh, those of us who, who specialize in higher education think about our work within that context? That question. <laughs> I thought it was to the broader oh, those yeah, of us. But maybe, um, starting with you, so and then maybe I think, others have a um, thought. You know, I I wasn't as familiar with um, candidate Newsom as you are. Mm -hmm. um, when you serve on the boards of either the UC or the CSU, um, the lieutenant governor is a voting member of those boards, and so I had a chance to. Um, serve with Lieutenant Governor Newsom. But I, as he became a candidate, um, I, I recognized a boldness and a, and a sense of how visionary he wants to be for California. Um, I can't remember his slogan, but change for California, or a change towards for California, towards a change for California. Yeah. And I think that's great, because a lot of people could say, you know, California is, you know, it's on fire, the economy has never been stronger, you know, but he also understands that that won't be forever, and that you, when you go through times of, of change, um, that's actually an opportunity to rethink how do you deliver services and how do you provide um, for, the, for the residents of California. So I think he's thinking about that sort of repositioning. Um, the, the organizations, and many of them are in this room, that have been um, in some ways advising the candidate, um, there are certain things that he has publicly acknowledged and agreed to, that California needs a better data system, that California systems of higher education need to cooperate, and they should, there should be a, 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 some sort of a coordinating body that allows them to um, cooperate across the segments. Um, he's committed to diversity on the governing boards. Uh, so there's a, a series of things that, um, that they have said yes to. But I think our challenge is to actually help them think about 
the, the fundamental issues that surfaced in this survey. If the system of financing higher education has to change so that it's more predictable, so that there's a, a, perhaps a, some sort of a dedicated revenue stream that's tied to some accountability measures, how would you actually do that? How, from a policy point of view, working with the legislature, could this next governor actually put in motion a new funding formula um, that supports higher education? I think it's a fascinating idea and, and one that um, should be explored. The other thing is um, this, this sense that, and College Futures and, and many in the room, I, I think, ascribe to this, that you know, we're doing a pretty good job right now of graduating students out of the K-12. Um, you know, the, the reforms that have been underway in the K-12 are actually starting to deliver. Um, so you've got higher graduation rates, but then there are issues on, on the receiving end. So the community colleges um, aren't transferring. They might be receiving students, but they're not transferring at the right um, rates. The four-year institutions aren't graduating at the right rate. So if we begin to think about higher education as a continuum, and you, you acknowledge that you can't isolate solutions by segment, but you need to think about it across segments, um, what does that start to look like? And how do you not actually just have a coordinating body, but a coordinated solution that serves students? That's where I think the governor, um, and you know, the one thing that when we were talking about this, because Mark is very careful of not sharing results, so I had to like take notes, and we were just <laughs> talking about this last week. Um, I thought, you know, this survey gives the next governor permission to be bold. It says, we're ready. And um, I think if you take that with the visionary leadership that I think um, Governor-elect Newsom um, is capable of demonstrating and come up with some high impact opportunities, um, it could really begin to, to shift this. And then not only cradle to career, but complement that vision and these activities with his um, sense of what the future workforce needs and how do you maintain the competitive, competitiveness of the state. So I think there's a real opportunity. Um, it's not easy to do, but to your point earlier, um, it feels like the legislature's ready, feels like the California public is ready, and um, you know we might be able to get something done. I think so. Seems that way. And uh, if you could, this will, our conversation today will be up on a video. So if you could make one suggestion um, for the next uh, governor, Governor-elect um, Newsom, as to what he could do to signal that higher education mm. is a high priority, what would you suggest that he do? Gosh, that's a great question. Others could answer that. You know, well. he's said that... Um, he would increase funding. I think that's a great thing to say. I'm not sure it's always doable, so I don't know that that's a signal. Um, I, think, I think strategy is supported by people. Mm -hmm. So who he designates as a go-to person in higher education, to me, is a, would be a strong signal. Well, maybe, you should, uh, maybe you. <laughs> Actually, when I think about that, that would be a strong signal. But you're you're in a strong place to to uh, to have a positive influence, and 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 we appreciate that very much. And um, any other ideas? Yeah. Yes, there's a hand right here. Sure. Question. Sure. Yeah. Questions are good too. Um, one, I just want to thank you both for hosting this event. I think the yeah. surveys from or the insights from the survey one, validate and reaffirm a lot of the experiences of students in college today. Um, and I'm wondering, one, what role do you see students playing in elevating this, the insights from the survey? And two, how can we as organizations working in this space help those students do that? Thank you. Great I question. that question. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a more powerful voice than students when it comes to education. 
Um, and so maybe what we can do is offline and think of strategy. We have talked about how to take these findings, um, present them to the new administration, to the legislature, maybe even to the segments, um, the segments being community college, UC and CSU. But um, socializing them with student organizations might be a great thing to do, and then have you take these messages forward, I think is a fantastic idea. I completely agree. And there's, there's no voice, from my perspective, no voice that, that speaks with, with more, um, more knowledge and more credibility than the students. And, and I speak for that when, when I go and talk to the regents, and usually I'm waiting with the student groups, and I'm like talking to the student groups. And um, uh, I think that, that, uh, that, that, that you can um, play a very powerful role, and uh, we, we want to engage with you on that. We do. Other comments or questions? Yes. <laughs> The perspective of the independent and uh, always valued. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for this event. Just a quick question. What is, Do you want to identify yourself? Yes, uh, Thomas Vu with the Association of Independent California Colleges and Universities. We represent uh, nonprofit yeah. higher education institutions in the state. Uh, just a quick question. Would like to get your thoughts on. Um, on, on this, uh, most of the survey was uh, was about uh, the public higher education institutions. What insights or points can private institutions uh, draw from this survey? Um, I, you know, I think for a lot of the public, they they see uh, they don't make the distinctions between public and private not not for profit, um, and so I think that there's a lot of uh, of, of of issues that would resonate, in ter especially in terms of affordability. And, you know, Kristen uh, Soros and I have talked about this uh, quite a bit. Uh, but I, I also want to say that, um, and, and this comes from my discussions with Kristen and, uh, and, and appreciation for what is done in the private not-for-profits in terms of student support, that I, that I hope that there is a, um, an ongoing discussion between the private not-for-profits and um, the um, uh, public higher education system about uh, how, what we can learn from the private not-for-profits about uh, student support and uh, efforts that have been made, which have been very successful to make sure that underrepresented students um, succeed when, when, and succeed in a timely fashion. And so I, I would hope that it goes both ways. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you. That was a great conversation. Right. Thank you. Thanks Let's do it again. <laughs>